Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. This summer, FaithBridge is sending 383 students and 52 leaders on 34 different journeys across 10 different sites on what we call the road. We believe mission is a lifestyle and that each student is called to be a kingdom difference maker. The road is the most substantive opportunity of growth, impact, and development that we offer students. Over the course of the summer, students from 5th through 12th grade will be making an impact in sites around the country and around the world. Feeding the physical and spiritual needs of those from right here in Houston, the southern United States, Central America, and even Europe. Our students will be helping the homeless. They will be running vacation Bible schools. Leading kids camps, sports camps. Serving in women and children's shelters. Working to provide Bibles to those who need them around the world. Building shelters and proclaiming the gospel to the four corners of the earth. When you see a student going on the road, tell them thank you for the ministry that they are doing, making a difference for the kingdom of God around the world. And let me say, as student pastor, thank you, FaithBridge, for making this possible through your continued generosity and prayerful support. Well, I am excited that you're here today. Welcome, whether you're in Cinecourt West today or Cinecourt East or whether it's the Woodlands campus or whether you're worshiping online, however it is that you're here today, we're really glad that you're here. It's a special day. It's special because it's all about our student missions. And I have to explain to you, this is the hub. This is the epicenter of what we do with our teenagers. And, and just so you kind of know, although probably any of you that have ever come from another church situation, you would know, that is most youth ministries rally around certain things like a summer camp or, or a trip or something like that. And then they, they usually stick in a mission trip or two. And that's kind of like just for a few extra kids, maybe there's like eight kids kids that go on the mission trip, or 12, or maybe 15, or maybe 20, we're going to have 383 kids going on 34 mission trips this summer. It's the coolest thing. I'm so grateful. I'm so excited about what is happening here, and for the leadership that is developed in these kids. And it's personal for the Warlines this year for the first time. Not just am I excited as the leader to get to watch all of this, but as a dad, our Wesley now moves into the program. And so even, you know, a few months ago, we were working on his application, and he turned it in, and then last Wednesday night, he and I sat right over there and, and for the parent training and the meeting that we had. I'm taking notes just like all the other parents. And so it's, it's personal for the first time, and that just makes it all the more uh, meaningful and, and fulfilling. We staff... Uh, really for this whole thing. Our youth ministry staff carries nine people full-time throughout the year. Then we add 16 interns in the summer. Add to this 180 volunteers who serve with our student ministry. And it's just a powerful thing that's going on here. I'm just so excited about it. Now, by the end of the service, there, there may be any number of you that say, I want to be a part of that. I want to help what is going on. There's two ways that you could do that. The first is that you might want to roll up your sleeves and say, you know, I'd like to help like be manpower and like be a volunteer in this thing and, and find out more about that. Why don't you contact the student ministry this week and they can get an application and you can talk with them, sit down and have a meeting with one of those people about coming into the program here for the next year. And then there's another way that you can help and that is financially. Now let me explain what I'm talking about here. It costs $350,000, a third of a million dollars for us to do what we do in student missions all around the world, okay? That's a, a big 
chunk of our budget, right? And so a lot of our faith promise dollars, missions dollars go to this, and that's an exciting thing. But even recently, I was meeting with Seth, our director, and he was explaining, okay, now we we had even more kids than we had expected, and so we're looking at about a $20,000 gap, but I think if we cut this, and we cut this, and we cut this, I think I can get us there. And I said, no, wait, 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 wait. I mean, cut anything that you can afford to cut, but I don't want you to cut anything. I mean, it's such a quality program that we're doing this is my job I'll go raise you twenty thousand dollars okay and so that's how I want you to help today you say well your timing is just impeccable because we just took the offering in case you weren't paying attention pastor Ken well so but here's what I know I know that any number of you have iPhones and you do your your Bill paying and you know, offering giving online, and or if you brought a checkbook, you can you can drop it in the little slots on your way out uh, in the walls in Center Court East or West. If you're the Woodlands today, you can give it to one of the green or white shirt people in the back on your way out. Just an extra. Maybe you say, you know, I've got an extra hundred bucks or two hundred bucks or thousand or two thousand. I can help close that gap along the way. Now. Any number of you, you've also received prayer and support letters from these kids. You're like, yeah, have I ever? I've gotten about five or ten of them. And so you just reply to those kids and you support them individually. But I'm talking here primarily to those of you who are maybe on the the newer side of the periphery. You don't have a connection to the kids. You didn't get one of those prayer letters uh, and support letters. Um, So you could do that just by going online and giving to the all-in fund. And that way, th- those dollars will go for scholarship funds for kids. Okay? That's how you can help. Let me tell you about our preacher of the day. She is Jill Sullivan, the wife of Michael Sully Sullivan. You know him because he's our business administrator and he preaches here. He preached about a month ago. Jill, though, is, I think, definitely the cuter half of the new. <laughs> Sullivan family. He said even between services, now could you tweak how you've said that? I said, I'm not tweaking a thing. I'm sticking with it. And uh, so she's going to come. She's beloved here. She's been on our staff for four years. She's our junior high and senior high small groups coordinator, does a marvelous job and has a marvelous word for us today. Let's welcome Jill as she comes to bring God's word to us now. Well, good morning, everybody. As Ken said, my name is Jill Sullivan, and I get to work here at FaithBridge with our incredible student ministry. I am the junior high and high school small groups coordinator, so that means I get to invest in and interact with both our junior high and high school small group leaders, and then also the students within our ministry as well. And I may just be slightly biased, but I think I have the greatest job ever. I love it, and I love our student ministry here. Well, in case I haven't gotten the chance to meet you through student ministry yet, you may know me through a totally different context. Just a couple months ago, my husband, who is Michael Sullivan, or known to a lot of you as Sully, preached a sermon on why prayer. Well, in his sermon, he used an analogy that included the throw pillows on our bed at home. Probably remember. So this morning, I have a couple pictures of our bedroom that he showed to refresh your memory. The first one we have on the screen is the before picture, before what, or what our bedroom looked like before we got married back in September. This was his bedroom when he was living it up in the bachelor life. Pretty simple. And then this picture... <laughs> This is the after picture. So in case you have been wondering who is this person behind the transformation of pre-marriage to post-marriage, that is me. Yep. And for that, thank you, thank you. I think it's better. I think it's better. But for that reason, I have earned or gained the title around here as the throw pillow lady. You would not believe the amount of emails and texts that we have received. And then even encounters I have in the atrium where people will say, oh, there's a throw pillow lady. So it has been quite a funny and crazy process. 
Well, this morning is a unique Sunday in that our 5th through 12th grade students are joining us in service at both the Klein campus and the Woodlands campus in order to be commissioned and prayed over by us for their summer mission journeys or mission trips that they're going on. It is mind-blowing to me, but we get to send out over 370 students on 34 different trips to 16 locations locally, nationally, and then even internationally like you saw in that video. So these students will get to be the display of Jesus to people who may or may not have ever heard of him before. So this morning, I want us to all come around this idea of what it is to be living on mission. Not only once a year on a summer mission journey or mission trip, but instead what it could look like for us to be living a lifestyle of mission. So if you will, bow your heads with me and we'll pray and then I'll get started. Well, God, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for this time together that we get to Just lean into your word and lean into your truth and learn what it is that you have for us as our mission. God, would you stir in our hearts today? Would you lead us to obedience to you? Would we be um, excited about how to leave here today living a lifestyle of mission for you, God? So God, just be with us in this time. I pray that you would open our hearts, you would open our ears and and our minds to hear what you have to tell us this morning. We love you, and we pray this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, over spring break just this year, I had the incredible opportunity to travel to Paris, France, on a mission trip through FaithBridge. And the main purpose of our trip was to go over to Paris, go on to college campuses, and then hopefully get to share the gospel with students that we encountered and may have felt led to share with. Well, just a week before we left, we were challenged to write down on little slips of paper any fears that we were feeling walking into the week. So after just a little reflecting, I realized that my main fear for the trip revolved around the very thing that we were going to France to do. I was so fearful of sharing the gospel with these students. I was afraid that I was going to get on campus over there and not know who in the world that I was supposed to share with. Then I was afraid that if I did find a student to share with, that I would just be blank. I would not have the words to say or that I wouldn't be able to steer away from just relational conversation or questions and move toward explicitly communicating the gospel with these students. I had this picture in my head of me sitting across from maybe two or three students, them waiting for me to make the next move, while I sat there frozen, wide-eyed, and just without words. Then I was fearful that if I did somehow find the right words to say, that I might offend that student or that they could reject this news of Jesus, the good news of the gospel. And I wonder this morning if you have ever been in a similar situation, or maybe you have felt some of these same fears that I had. Have you ever felt a nudge of the Holy Spirit to maybe lead the way to sharing the gospel with somebody, yet in the back of your mind you have thought, But how do I know if this is the right person who I am meant to share with? How do I know that in the first place? Or maybe you're thinking, but I have built up a relationship with this person for years now. I don't want to lose the relational traction or trust that I have gained by moving this conversation to a spiritual place now. Or maybe your fear is not in who to share with, but instead it's in what to say or how to share. Maybe you envision yourself across the table from somebody like me and finding yourself frozen and without words. Or maybe you think, I'm not a scholar. I don't have the answers to every question that they could start to fire back at me. I don't know everything. Or lastly, maybe your fear is that if you do weave the gospel into conversation, that you could offend them. 
And what do we even do in that situation? Do we say, well, thanks, hope you had a great day, and then exit that conversation as quickly as we can? Well, these fears are our reality. Each one of us in this room today probably struggles with some sort of fear associated with sharing the gospel. And these fears can keep us totally intimidated and uncomfortable to share, which could prevent us from living this lifestyle of mission. Well, today I want us together to move through our fears or our hesitancies of sharing the gospel and instead move toward what it could look like for us to be living this lifestyle of mission together. So today we are going to be reading from John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and flip open there to John chapter 4. If you don't have your Bibles, the ushers are coming down the aisles, so you can raise your hand, flag one of them down, and use it. And then if you need to take one home with you, that can be our gift to you today. Well, before we dive in and start to read together, I'm going to be reading in verses 27 through 30 and 39 through 42, but I want to give you a little context for verses 1 through 26, what has happened in build-up to where we are going to jump in. So in verse 27, where we jump in, Jesus is in the middle of a conversation between him and a Samaritan woman. He was traveling through Samaria at about noon on a given day, and he had been traveling half that day so far. So it's imaginable that he was probably thirsty. He was weary and tired. So he found a well where he could just rest for a while and draw some water, hoping to refresh himself. Well, as he's there, he's approached by this Samaritan woman, which was not at all a normal time for people to be coming out to the well. Most people would have gone in the early, early hours of the morning for a couple of different reasons. One, they would have been going out in preparation for a full day's worth of chores. They would have been getting water for the whole day for cooking, washing dishes, washing clothes, cleaning, things like we do. Then also they would have been going in the early hours of the morning because it was the coolest time of the day. They didn't want to go at noon because it would have been scorching and hot, therefore pretty miserable, just like going anywhere on a summer's day in Houston at about noon. Nobody wants to do that. So the irregular time of the visit of this woman could indicate she was trying to avoid these large crowds, potentially because of the low social standing that she had in her town. And when I do say that she had a low social standing, she had quite a reputation around her area. Therefore, when or if she was around large crowds, it's likely that she was looked down upon. She was probably talked about behind her back, making her feel shame. Well, Jesus said that this was because she had had five husbands already in her lifetime and that the man she was currently with, she wasn't even married to. Well, even in the social construct of today, of 2016, that thought would cause us to pause. And that would have been even more true back in her day, in that time. Well, as she and Jesus begin to interact, they have the most gracious exchange. Jesus breaks through very long-standing social and cultural barriers, not only between Jews and Samaritans, but also just between men and women. As he sits with her, he takes the time to talk to her. He starts to communicate to the lady details of her life. He says, I know you. I know everything about you. I know the greatest parts of you. And then I know the worst parts of you, the bad parts, the parts that you are ashamed of. Well, this leads her to question, who in the world is this guy? And how does he know everything about me? That's a little bit creepy. Well, Jesus says to her, I am the Messiah that you have been anticipating. I'm the one that you have been waiting for. So he offers her this spiritual water of eternal life with which she would never thirst again, unlike the water that she had been drawing from the well. So this is where we pick up and start to read in verse 27. So I am going to read verses 27 through 30, 
And then I'm going to jump ahead to verses 39 through 42. So starting in verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to her people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And then in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Well, this morning, I want to draw out three helpful observations from this passage that will help model for us what it looks like for us to be living on this mission. The first observation that we can make today is that the woman is sharing with her own people. In verses 28 and 29, we read that as soon as she encounters Jesus at the well, she goes straight back to her town and her people to share there. Those are people who would have known her story. They would have known her past and her social standing. They would have rubbed shoulders with her all the time. Therefore, they would have noticed how drastic this change in her was, or the transformation, from when she was walking out to the well with her head hung low and she was trying to avoid large crowds and be by herself, and then upon her joyful return, when she was wanting to speak with every person who she encountered, they would have noticed that change in her. Well, many of you have probably heard of Rick Warren, who is a pastor out in California and then author of the book, A Purpose Driven Life. Well, Warren was contacted by a president and CEO of an international sports apparel company who had read the book and then been totally and completely changed. The CEO said, I've read this book and I am now a Christian. I just need to know one thing. Should I resign as CEO of my company and become a pastor? Well, Warren communicates to this CEO, no, you need to stay exactly where you are because you already have 25,000 employees who you can reach out to, you can pray for them, be available to them, and then even just prioritize Christian principles in your business because then they'll learn how to live on mission. Warren also says, you've got huge testimony with your other CEOs. Warren said, you need to stay a CEO because you'll have far more influence on them as a CEO than as a pastor or a ministry. Well, Warren was trying to demonstrate how effective it could be for this CEO to stay in his sphere because his employees and his fellow CEOs could see his transformation from before Jesus to after. They could see his life change. Well, you may be thinking, that sounds great, Jill. That sounds awesome. He can influence so many people in his role, 25,000, but I am never going to be a CEO. Well, truth is, most of us in this room probably never will be. However, each of us, has huge influence in whatever role that we are in. If you are a teacher, you have tremendous influence on countless students and parents who you interact with on a daily basis. Or if you are a stay-at-home parent, you have the role of discipling and training up your kids to seek after Jesus, to know who he is and follow him day to day. Or students, you've got influence in your lunchroom every day with the people who sit with you. You've got that built-in time to minister to them. So ministering to our own people is essential. So my question for you this morning is who are the people that you can go back to after today and you can begin to share with? 
Maybe this morning you pray for just a few specific names and maybe jot those down on your bulletin insert who you can go back to and begin to live on mission with because the harvest is so plentiful within our own people who we have already. Well, the second observation that we can draw out is that as the woman starts to share, she is simply sharing her story. She's sharing her testimony. In verse 39, we read, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Well, I imagine that as this woman rushed back to her town, that she was filled and overflowing with a sense of thrill and urgency to speak of this man who she had met. I imagine that she didn't have a script or a formula that she was following, but instead, the account she gave was probably personal. It was probably super animated, and it was gripping to other people because of the nature of the encounter. Her story was beginning to unfold. Well, the Greek word for testimony is martyria, which means to bear witness that provides a firsthand authentication to a fact of importance to many people. So as we, just like this woman, began to share our testimony, we will be authenticating or giving weight to who Jesus is to the people around us. We're just making him real to the people around us. In a sermon on this very same passage, Pastor Tim Keller highlights a few things about the way that this woman shares. He says she shares with transparency, with simplicity, and with bravery. And he says that when these three qualities are woven together in someone's story, that all of a sudden it is powerful. It's relatable to other people because it feels real. So it's attractive and it brings others in. They want to hear what's going on. Well, while I was in France in spring break in Paris, I got to meet a girl named Cyril who exhibited these very three qualities. She was a believer over there and she had met the team that had gone to Paris a year ago. And because she was so encouraged just to meet and talk with other believers, she wanted to meet up with us when we got there this year. So as we met her in a school cafeteria, we sat around this table and kind of caught up like friends do, even though we had never met her before. And she told us about how her last year had been. She said, I have grown so much. I've been transformed. She said, I've been confirmed into my church. I've experienced my very first communion, but yet I am still left wanting more and more of the presence of Jesus in my life. But I think the neatest part of the conversation was that Cyril said because of her life change and because of her testimony starting to play out that her mom began to notice, and her mom desires a relationship with Jesus because of her story. Well, the good news that I get to share with you today is that Cyril's mom is now a believer. She's following Jesus too. And Cyril said, this is all due to my story. She got to see it, so it was real. Cyril was transparent in the way that she shared. She was simple in the way that she spoke of who Jesus was. And then she was so brave, not only to share with her mom and let her mom into what was going on, but she was brave to share with these strangers from Texas who she had never met before. Well, our third observation is that people will come to know and experience Jesus for themselves. In verses 41 and 42, we read... Because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Well, John is writing that many of these Samaritans come to believe in Jesus, not because of the words of the woman, not because of her story, but because of the words of Jesus himself that they had first heard the words of this woman, they had heard her story, but then they were so stirred by it that they were led to seek out time with Jesus for themselves. 
So as we begin to live on mission, we have got to remember that it will never, ever be of our own words or our own efforts or our own power to bring others into salvation, but instead, Jesus will be the one who speaks his words into them and transforms them completely. Well, I found this to be completely true in my relationship with my grandmother, Brownie. And in case you were wondering, yes, that was her real name. She had a tagline that she would use every time that she introduced herself to somebody. She would say, hi, my name is Brownie. Yes, just like the chocolate dessert. And yes, it is my real name. She was quite a character. Well, she lived in the same town that we did growing up, and so we had a good relationship with her and spent a good amount of time with her. But over the years, as I got older, I think it was when I was in college, I began to realize that I had never heard her specifically verbalize Jesus. I never heard her talk about the gospel or the ways that she had gone from death to life and Jesus was working in her. She would mention praying periodically, but that was about the extent of the conversation about God that we had for a while. Well, I prayed for years, for years, that she would come to know and experience Jesus for herself. I wanted that for her so badly. Well, I will never forget one day, she and I were just one-on-one in her bedroom, and she looked over at me very matter-of-factly, and she said, Jill, I do believe that Jesus died for me to forgive me for my sins. And I do believe that he's with me and that he's in me. And I wanted to lose it. In one moment, I was so excited that that had happened. And then in the other, I was realizing that I had been trusting in my own words and in my own efforts and my own power in the explanations that I tried over and over to see if it would land on fertile soil. But she was saying, I have heard for myself, and I know that he really is the Messiah. Well, to review, what we have to learn from this woman in our passage is that we can share with our own people. When we do share, we can just share our story. We can share our testimony of the ways that Jesus has worked in us and is at work in us. And then we've got to trust that people will come to know Jesus for themselves. It will be of his words. Well, maybe this morning you are experiencing Jesus for the very first time. Maybe like Brownie, you have been pointed to him over and over again. But for some reason today, it's sinking in that he loves you. He knows everything about you. He knows the great, great, great parts about you that he gifted you with. But then he also knows the part that you're ashamed of. He knows the bad parts. Yet, he loves you unconditionally. Maybe you're realizing he died for you. Well, if this is you, don't hesitate to let Jesus into your heart this morning because he will immediately begin to transform you. And then you get to share just as the woman did. Well, this is what we share for. We live this lifestyle on mission in hopes that others would come to know Jesus for themselves. So my prayer is that we all move into that perspective today. Well, this is exemplified by the students who we get to commission and send out this morning. They have been led to Jesus or pointed to him by someone or something in their lives, but they are now saying, We have heard for ourselves, and we know that he really is the Savior. He is worth following. They want to be sent out so that they can say, Come, see a man. He really is the Messiah. Well, bow your heads and pray with me. God, thank you for this morning, and I thank you for this mission that you do encourage us to live on. God, would we start to share our story with people? Would we be brave to share with our own people who we already have in our lives, God? And would we trust that you will transform, that people will come to know you for themselves, God? That's truth. So God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the ways that it calls us into action. God, we love you and we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 
Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at Faith Bridge, and I'm here with Jill Sullivan, our student ministry small group coordinator, who just brought the message, Living a Lifestyle of Mission. Welcome, Jill. Thanks, Luann. What a great message today, and loved how we highlighted the road and our student missions program, and the message that you brought really about evangelism and sharing mm -hmm. the gospel and how to how to integrate that into our everyday lives mm -hmm. as we try to live on mission. And so we had a few questions come in, so I'm just gonna jump into asking those, okay? All right. All right, so the first question that came in is, what do I do if I have a bad reputation with my own people? Maybe I feel like I've already blown my own witness, Christian witness with them. Well, I would say that you are in the same boat as the woman who we did study, that she was trying to avoid large crowds. She was ashamed of her reputation and she felt like she was worthless. That was why she was going to the well by herself. That was why she was avoiding people. So that could be similar to you. But I would encourage you that as she did, after she experienced Jesus, she had the bravery and boldness to still go up to people. She initiated conversations in sharing with her community. So I would say you do the same thing. Have the bravery to do so even if it's uncomfortable or even if you feel like you are shameful or different than other people. I would just encourage you to still approach them. Okay, that's good. And I know sometimes when you, um, maybe maybe you're the first one from your friends to become a Christian, mm -hmm. um, that it can take time for people to see yes, these definitely. type of changes yep. in you. So just encouraging people to continue to be faithful to those yes. things. Um, okay, next question that comes around um, is, so for the person who maybe hasn't had the big 180 transformation, where the transformation in their life has been smaller, how do I make my transformation noticeable to people um, if my transformation isn't so drastic or dramatic mm -hmm. as the woman of the well? Maybe I've known Jesus for longer or my before Christ isn't quite as shocking or different as my after Christ, how can I make those changes noticeable? Well, I would say you just need to be talking about what Jesus is doing in you, because mm. that is going to look different for everybody. It'll look different from you to me in the ways that Jesus is working in us. So just be honest with where you are right now and where you've come from, because that is your own personal story that you get to share. It doesn't necessarily have to be a huge drastic change. It doesn't have to be black and white completely. It's a process, just like we were just talking about. It takes time for us to change. That's good. Um, and so the last question uh, came around a lot of the things we were talking today is, how do you see the Lord help you overcome fear? Um, what are some practical steps to overcoming the fear that you might feel when you're sharing truth mm -hmm. with people? Well, I did get to experience that in reality in France over spring break. I was terrified before I went on that trip. I was so fearful that I really did, like I said, would just be blank when I got in front of those students. But I think some practical steps that I would share would just be to pray that you would have strength and you would have the courage to actually approach them and just talk. And then I would even say, maybe remove yourself from the task of it and look at the person who is sitting before you. Think about where their heart is, who they are, what they're passionate about, um, the situation of their life, and then how you can just speak into that. Hmm. Being in conversation and relationship with people. Um, well, you certainly are, are doing a good job of overcoming the fear <laughs> and even getting to talk about it in yes, so, so many ways. I know that's huge. For me, when I started sharing with people, I also felt like I had so much fear and um, just the Bible saying that that doesn't come from the Lord, mm -hmm. that He wants yes. us to walk in power. So thank you so yeah. much for all the practical ways that you uh, encouraged us today, but also just encouraging us to share our faith. 
and be on mission. So thank you for your message today. Sure. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.